Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we're going to have a bit of a romp, and we've decided (laughs) that we're going to talk about vulgarity, the profane, and the obscene, which is a very complicated social and linguistic topic, and it is a moving dial constantly (laughs) from ancient times to modern times, and if we're paying attention, we'll see how certain terms or behaviors slide back and forth between something that's acceptable or barely noticeable into the vulgar and back and forth. And Jung also has something to say about this as well as some of his own personal experiences. And of course, this has to do with shadow. And for many of us, vulgar, obscene, and profane things that we often dream about. So with that, let's Mm -hmm. whip it out and throw it around. (laughs) (laughs) Joseph, that was was indescribably vulgar. (laughs) It was. And I am really, I am very naughty that way. I mean, I I reined it in on the podcast, but I have an extremely body sense of humor and have had oh, since I was really it. young. I know. <laughs> I know it. So like I'm smiling right now, the the kind of delight in being um profane. Yeah. 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 And and I mean it's it just to stay there for just a second, I think I mean I know that about you. It's one of the things I really love about you that, you know, when we're just hanging out, you know, I mean <laughs> we made some of the most absurdly stupid vulgar jokes uh, about the names of certain ancient Greek plays, for example. Uh, and we still laugh really about great. it. And that happened like nine years yeah, it's ago. It's so stupid. <laughs> I know. Oh, God, but it's funny. But, um, but, you know, you don't often bring that up on the podcast. And I think it's partly because, you know, going to, going to persona for a second it doesn't really fit with an analytic persona to be vulgar Ah. or, you know, so it's, it's not, it's not something that many of us would whip out as it were in a kind of work (laughs) environment. So it's compensatory. Uh, You brought up shadow, Joseph. And so it just as shadow is compensatory to persona, it may be that vulgarity uh, is compensatory to uh, civilized, uh, upscale, sophisticated, dare we say, analytic uh, presentation. <laughs> yeah, it is true. Like when we've been in uh, some Jungian conferences and people are reading papers, I'll look around the room and uh, people uh, all look like they're like Victorian old yeah. ladies, men and women. By the way, they're like tittering, yes, yeah. like you know, like ooh. Like, oh my gosh, is that real? <laughs> have we all become so delicate? We, we like are going to have fainting spells, you know, if somebody says a four letter word. It's extraordinary. Well, I just have to warn you all if you ever become an analyst and join an original, do not sit next to Joseph <laughs> during a meeting or a presentation <laughs> because he will share. He will scribble in your notebook the most outrageous things that are so <laughs> vulgar and obscene. And, and he and will draw make little you laugh pictures. And it'll make you laugh really inappropriately. Yes, I'm favorite for, so we all know, for my cartoons of the Joseph. speakers. Yes. Yeah, right. Oh, so God. You just remind me of that. Any of them. Can't repeat any of it. So in that realm, so. let's we're talking about um, the release of social tensions and taboos. 
that vulgarity often involves topics or language that's considered taboo or socially yeah. restricted. And engaging in that and enjoying vulgar content often allows us to feel released from the norms and the pressures of polite society. It is often a safe outlet for expressing emotions and frustrations that are typically suppressed or deemed inappropriate in public context. So releasing mm -hmm. social tension and taboos. So we like to transgress. Yes. And we need to. It's transgressive. Okay. And so when we think about even the, um, the beginning of psychoanalytic work, you know, it's Vienna, it's Freud, it's people living in an incredibly um, ritualized, repressive environment, and particularly sexually repressive. Um, this is a time when people are, um, are clothed from their neck to their ankles, and even revealing an ankle could be considered vulgar <gasps> and sexually provocative. Mm -hmm. So talk about being just constantly yeah. put into a, a box. And Freud was also saying that this was making people unwell to not have any place to break open from these restraints and norms. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, just to put, put that, bring that, bring another image in, um, Let's see. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, I think Jung was like 11 or something when it was written. So that would have been the, you know, some, sometime in the waning years of the 19th century. So the same time period that you're talking about, Joseph, which, you know, that, that's an image of someone breaking out of these very, uh, rigid persona roles, you know, of, of Dr. Hyde. Is that right? Doc, Mr. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? I'm no, so it's Dr. Jekyll. Yes. So, and he becomes Mr. Hyde, you know, where he can do any, anything that he wants as a kind of compensation to the very prim and proper and uh, pro-social persona of Dr. Jekyll. In a way, that takes vulgarity into a really dark, uh, its darkest possible aspect, because Mr. Hyde is, is evil, and eventually the character cannot control uh, the transition from the good, uh, urbane Dr. Jekyll to the evil, murderous Mr. Hyde. Uh, versus, you know, what we typically think of as vulgarity, which is, in a way, a kind of innocent uh, transgression. Uh, that uh, we're, We talk about things we really shouldn't talk about, like sex, or swearing, or, or, or poop-related jokes that kids just love. Kids just love uh, humor about poop and pee and farting. Um, they really love all of that kind of stuff. I, I love that humor too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's an innocence often to this kind of vulgarity. And then there are sophisticated uh, comedians that can elevate vulgarity to uh, satire and uh, social, socially pointed uh, humor of, of all sorts. Uh, but it does have its darkest uh, side of, of how far can you take the transgression. Right. And that has to do with that fine line between um, tickling someone's nervous system so that there's a little bit of a thrill, a laughter, a kind mm -hmm. of unexpected, incongruent uh, part of a sentence right. versus going far enough that people become anxious. And then all of a sudden, this kind of superego kicks in. And then this mm -hmm. cultural police force in our side of our own minds mm -hmm. begins to start feeling aggressive and creating anxiety inside of us, which is, again, what Freud said, is that we do have this kind of internalized monitor called the superego. And if we go too far, it kind of tases us with anxiety. 
so that the shadow doesn't have but so much latitude. But going back a little bit to uh, humor, I do want to say that um, this kind of thing has been around forever. Here's a, um, here's a little scene in Shakespeare in The Taming mm, uh, of the Shrew. So, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. so Petruchio and Katrina. And Petruchio is about a, kind of a rakish um, swag guy, and he's courting Katrina, who's this very sharp-tongued woman. And they have a famous exchange. So Petruchio says, Who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? In his tail? Katrina. In his tongue? Petruchio. Whose tongue? Katrina. Yours if you talk of tails. And so farewell. Petruchio. What? With my tongue and your tail? Nay, come again, good Kate. I'm a gentleman. So, um... <laughs> the- <laughs> So, so it's, it's here again and again and again, and uh, yeah. it doesn't seem that funny right now, but I think <laughs> quite some time ago, that would have been considered very body humor, yeah. and that's something that was showing up um, in plays that the nobility were seeing. This is also mm. part of French Restoration um, theater. Um, and Moliere had numerous plays where uh, the characters would say very bawdy, scandalous um, kinds of things and behaviors that were very, very hypersexual that people loved to see. And of course, we're still there now. Well, right. And Chaucer. Chaucer is Chaucer. full of uh, mm-hmm. vulgar humor. And there's some wonderful instances of uh, lively vulgarity in the ancient Greek plays and myths, and maybe we'll talk more about some of those too. So you're right. I think that this has kind of been with us uh, always. It's a kind of a, a, a part of being human. Let's, let's um, go, go to this very particular instance that Jung had uh, and, and, and a, a kind of important experience of a very vulgar fantasy Mm -hmm. that became extremely meaningful to him. And Deb, did you say that you have that pulled up? You want to read this? This is from... I have it, and the, the, the frame that I'm putting this in around vulgarity is uh, shattering norms. And, uh, the, the range of, of our ability through humor plays, scatological uh, things, of, from the innocent sort of uh, a tiny revolution that an audience can laugh at to something that is truly, truly disturbing uh, that goes into something darker. And this was uh, Jung um, when he was 10 or 11 years old, I think. And he says, I came out of school and went to the cathedral square. The sky was gloriously blue, the day one of radiant sunshine. The roof of the cathedral glittered, the sun sparkling from the new brightly glazed tiles. I was overwhelmed by the beauty of the sight and thought, the world is beautiful and the church is beautiful and God made all this and sits above it, far away in the blue sky on a golden throne and (gasps) here came a great hole in my thoughts and a choking sensation. I felt numbed and knew only, don't go on thinking now. Something terrible is coming. Something I do not want to think. Something I dare not even approach. I would be committing the most frightful of sins. What is the most terrible sin? Murder? No, not that. The most terrible sin is the sin against the Holy Ghost, which cannot be forgiven. Anyone who commits that sin is damned to hell for all eternity. Poor Jung walks home from school having had right at the cusp of consciousness this terrible, terrible thought that he can't think, and he tries to stop the thought. His mother sees that he's disturbed. He can't possibly tell his mother, you know, what's going on inside. The third night, the torment became so unbearable, I no longer knew 
what to do. Uh, why should I have to think of something so inconceivably wicked? Uh, God himself was arranging a decisive test for me. And then finally, he thinks the terrible thought. He had, he gathered all, I gathered all my courage as though I were about to leap forth with into hellfire and let the thought come. Is everybody bracing themselves? <laughs> I saw before me the cathedral, the blue sky. God sits on his golden throne high above the world. And from under the throne, an enormous turd falls upon the sparkling new roof, shatters it, and breaks the walls of the cathedral asunder. That is the horrible, unbearable, vulgar thought. And Jung says, I felt an enormous, indescribable relief. Instead of expected damnation, grace had come upon me. And with it, an unutterable bliss such as I had never known, I wept for happiness and gratitude. <laughs> uh, and then he, you know, he realizes, he thinks that uh, thinking the terrible forbidden thought was itself ordained by God, because if God had not sanctioned the thought, he would not have been able to think it. Um, so there's, there's much more here, and he says, why did God befoul his cathedral? But then came upon the dim understanding that God could be something terrible. And uh, he had experienced a dark and terrible secret. And uh, so I'm thinking that when we are experiencing vulgarity uh, in its humorous aspects, we're just dipping a toe into those dark waters that can also be. Uh, you know, as Jung experienced something truly dark and something truly transgressive and something that could be punished. Well, and it's it's such a great story because mm. uh, it it it, you know, there it is. It is a it is a sort of little myth, you know, of yes. of God destroying his temple. And it's an image of the shattering of the conventional container mm -hmm. and yes. and uh, the the transformation of a, a kind of uh you know profound transformation in the god image that prefigured a lot of jung's later work yes you know, in this you know and it's funny cuz I, I i often think about that little story there ha there's a slight kind of ocd quality to it like i can't think that thought i can't mm -hmm. think that thought i can't think that thought but then he's delivered from that by allowing in the vulgar, by allowing those norms to be shattered. And, and holding the tension of the opposites. Mm -hmm. That God is not only uh, good and beautiful and all of those attributes, but also can land a great turd on the mm -hmm. roof of the cathedral. Yeah. It's kind of like a Zen Cohen, right? That just presents mm -hmm. this absurdity. And I, I think that maybe a lot of vulgarity is like that, that it, pre it presents us with, a, with something mm -hmm. that's, that's really quite uh, incongruous or absurd. And so it makes us shift our perspective and have to see things in a new way. So. In that way, yeah. we might interpret this particular dream as, as an impulse of rebellion. So Jung's mm -hmm. father was a pastor and from a long yeah. line of religious leaders. And Jung had a very ambivalent feeling towards his father uh, and felt that his father was perhaps not sincere, maybe simply forced to be in that uh, profession, but perhaps not even quite believing the things yeah. that he was promoting. And Jung began to sense that at quite a young age. So the idea that this vulgar imagery was a way of pushing against that authority figure of this uh, religious incursion into his own psyche and changing, uh, breaking the pristine cathedral in his mind 
which then, just as he was saying, gave him this enormous sense of freedom and joy. I also think that the image of God sitting on a throne, which is kind of a potty, is an Im- is an image of God. <laughs> and God we call as, it the throne, right? Yes, is um, yeah. an infant of God as a, as a toddler, um, and and experiencing in some ways both a sense of mastery in terms of toilet training. That yes, you 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 <laughs> did sit on the throne and you did release the tension in the appropriate place, um, and also. It's a form of a creative act in a sense. And this is an old idea that um, very, very young children have this mysterious relationship uh, to their feces, that they don't quite understand how it happens, why it happens, what is it that's just appeared down there. Uh, And it seems like a very surprising mystery. Um, So there's a number of. uh, valences on that remarkable dream, and that Jung found whatever that was important enough to put in his memoir of all the thousands of dreams Mm -hmm. that he had. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't a dream, it was a thought. A thought. But um, but yes, it it stayed with him. It it felt like a, a huge revelation, actually. And like a dream, something had arisen from the unconscious. And I think for a lot of of vulgarity, transgression, uh, body humor, uh, it does press up from the unconscious. Uh, It it comes from another realm Mm -hmm. that, that wants to push against convention and virtue and propriety and all the rest of it and have what Jung experienced, a catharsis. That we burst out laughing at some Mm -hmm. comedian who upends a a conventional norm. And uh, Jung experienced it as, you know, as grace and relief and gratitude. But that's what we experience Mm -hmm. uh, with vulgarity, is a catharsis, um, including, here's one of my little facts that I uncovered, that swearing can activate the amygdala. And um, it will result in a little surge of adrenaline, and it's a source of natural pain relief. And uh, I had an aunt who worked um, in a long-term care home as a nurse, and when people had had strokes, one of the things that she did to help them regain some speech was to encourage them to swear. And that that was often a word that they could access most easily. And uh, a a way back into speech, uh, Mm -hmm. because it's connected with some primal part of the brain. It's not just left brain language. It's got punch Mm. and and feeling in it. Mm -hmm. And... And and wouldn't you want to be able to say some of those words? Mm-hmm. Uh, that makes perfect sense. That there is something um, enlivening and arousing with uh, both vulgar mm-hmm. humor as well as curse words, as well as uh, <laughs> doing things that were profane. In Albert Camus' um, book, The Plague. And he's detailing that in the face of certain death, how might different groups of people respond? And a a certain group of people, he imagines, would seek to do every kind of profane thing, going into the Mm. the cathedrals and having orgies uh, in the middle of the the cathedrals or on the altars. That something in some of us needs to break all the rules in order to feel free, mm. in order to, to try all the things that we've been told that we should not mm. and could not um, do. So talking a little bit about this back into humor, 
one of the things that um, we talk about is the shock value of vulgar language when particularly it's used creatively or unexpectedly. And it has to do with this idea of the incongruity theory of humor, where surprise or Mm -hmm. deviation from social expectations can provoke Mm -hmm. laughter. And this is sort of as a kind of playfulness, a a bending of both linguistic norms and, and expectations. When Milton Berle, who is a, an old comedian oh my from gosh. my parents' yes. generation, um, he would walk out on stage dressed in this very exaggerated uh, costume as a woman. And yes. it was at that time period that was so unexpected. People would just mm. fall out, and they loved it. They thought it was just delightful for this uh, craggy old guy. I think a, a modern version of that is this uh, uh, drag queen named uh, Dame Edna, who is a really hilariously <laughs> yes. funny right, a British comedian who is in that same spirit of uh, yes. incongruity. Yeah, yeah. Um, thinking of Benny Hill, too. Remember mm-hmm. Benny Hill? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And if you remember the old candid camera, so so much of what they would set up is just things that people didn't expect. And one of their really bawdy social experiments was a film series called What Do You Say to a Naked Woman or a Naked Lady? And what they would have (laughs) is they would have a model um, and a film crew, a secret film crew, um, put a naked woman in an elevator. And, and, and uh, you oh, couldn't I'm... get away with this now in a business, in a, in, in a bank, in a business environment. And the doors would open and people would walk in and they would just film how people would respond. Would they stare forward? <laughs> Guys would offer her their trench coats and she would be like, oh, no, 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 I'm fine. And uh, there's something would just make people squeal with, uh, oh my God. with delight. Oh. Yes, that's what, hilarious. what I'm appreciating is we're talking about uh, what you've mentioned before, Joseph, is the body element of vulgarity. Of th- This is not clever. It's not linguistically uh, adroit. It's really baseline uh, five-year-old humor. Yeah. And as adults... Uh, I mean, candid camera was very popular, and it is we we delight in it. We kind of roll around in the elemental naughtiness of it, of of poop and pee and naked people in elevators and all the rest <laughs> of it. Uh, there's a naughtiness uh, and a regression that is very enjoyable. Well, so yes, I'm, there is, I'm but, thinking about a term. <clears throat> Go ahead, Joseph. Uh, but I was thinking that, no, that those things okay. are, though, particularly about surprise and deviation from mm. social expectation. That you're surprised yes. to see this woman <laughs> on the elevator without any clothes on. I would say that it wasn't about it being obscene uh, or, or particularly yeah. vulgar. It's that it was shocking. It could be vulgar. Yeah. And it's, it's just, body. Could, it could be body, but I'm not sure that that's quite particularly the way that particular joke was being offered. I think the model was not there to be body, that she was there as if she wasn't even aware that she wasn't wearing clothing. Uh, I think what made it funny is that it was as if nothing at all was happening that was strange mm-hmm. and, and the slightest. Mm-hmm. Although, although there are lots of body humor that um, we all enjoy, uh, Bette Midler is fantastically body. Oh, yes. And she, very, she, very yes, funny. Um, and Dave Chappelle, of so course, can I'm, be incredibly funny. Yes, yes, yeah, he's great. I, I'm aware of how much energy we're all bringing to this conversation and how kind of energizing it is to talk about <laughs> this. and. Joseph, I think you used the term a few minutes ago, life-giving. 
And, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's interesting to think about that because I think it is, it does wake us up. You know, I mean, I think we were making those really silly jokes in analytic training when we were talking about the Oristia because, uh, you know, it was a long day. (laughs) And so we made really stupid, vulgar jokes about (laughs) wordplay and say what it is. (laughs) But, um, you know, it, 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 so what is that? Why is it life giving? Why is it energizing? And I, I think it is because we are stepping over a taboo and tapping into something that feels transgressive so there's there's something about it it kind of creates a little uh doorway into a part Mm -hmm. of the psyche that's been fenced off and disallowed and so then all of this new energy can flow in and you know if you think about attending a conference or something and one speaker after another gets up but when when someone kind of cracks a really good joke just how how much the energy in the room changes and and, uh, you know, these kinds of jokes in particular carry a lot of energy because they feel risky, too, because you might uh-huh. you might offend some people. It's a it's a risk. You're stepping out onto a high wire. But to think more uh-huh. about this being life giving, I, I want to go to a mythological uh-huh. example, and that is Baobo. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So when Demeter uh, is. uh, uh feeling so forlorn over the loss of her daughter, Persephone. Baobo is a ridiculous old woman who kind of comes and, and lifts her skirt up and uh, makes Demeter laugh. And this gesture of lifting up her skirt was actually something that was sometimes part of religious ceremony. So it's this very interesting place where something is... Um, where where the where the profane and the sacred are lie right next door to mm. one another a un, a real union of opposites mm-hmm. a, a, and the catharsis of the demeter laughs the release yeah the release yeah. Of, you know, it breaks um, and shatters it shatters a norm of a norm just of any kind of rationality um, the surprise, the shock, the the shift um, hits us in that place where we just have a reaction, and the the opposites come together in that moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's and, a, and I like to think uh, of Balbo as this kind of spicy old woman who just doesn't give an f. Uh, you know? <laughs> Well, and Can she's we also these saving words on the podcast. <laughs> but she has a larger mission. She's saving the earth. That Demeter's grief has literally blighted the earth. Yes. Um, and and people, animals, creatures are dying for lack mm-hmm. of of fecundity, yeah. lack of greenness and life. So Balbo, who is an ancient, ancient earth goddess which is part of her earthliness, yeah. comes forward to save life by not just lifting her skirt, but lifting her skirt and doing a silly dance and making funny sounds yeah. and, and parading around in a way that Demeter's yeah. could be distracted from her grief and the blighting of the earth could at least be suspended temporarily, that the need... Um, to break the grip of what I would say is pathologic grief. That actually is a category in the DSM, this idea of pathologic mm-hmm. grief and, and the way we sometimes need something that is pre-edible. We need something that is mm-hmm. young mm. and unsophisticated to mm-hmm. jar us out of something that we are trapped and that is, that is life killing. Mm-hmm. And and I I wonder if the if the if the category of gallows humor is mm-hmm. sort of in the same neighborhood because um, you know I mean emergency workers, doctors, um, you know people who are in really rough circumstances will 
will employ gallows humor. And I, I, you know, there have been times in my life when, when that was very much when I worked with, in refugees uh, in the former Yugoslavia, you know, sometimes we would really, really dark and really, really funny. And, and you, you know, it's so offensive, so offensive, but it, it, it allows you to, to dance with these really difficult, dark energies and kind yeah. of keep your head yes. up. Yeah. This goes to something that Peter Berger wrote about, which I mentioned before in his small book, A Rumor of Angels, where he talks about how remarkable it is that human beings can be in a very sincere relationship to something, like a tragedy in front of us, and then to radically and suddenly shift a perspective to jump above the distress of something and to see it as humorous. Um, that, that, that's a remarkable capacity yeah. for human beings and a coping yeah. mechanism. Yeah, yeah. I, and I liked what you said, Lisa, about dancing with darkness. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can go back to, to Jung and his terrible vision of uh, God dropping a turd on the cathedral. But he did dance with his own inner darkness and uh, the fear of that. And uh, for people that are in dire circumstances, like uh, you working in Yugoslavia, uh, emergency workers, et cetera, um, the darkness is there. And gallows humor, vulgarity, all of these things are ways of dancing with it mm -hmm. a and not just keeping it behind a defensive wall. It's also part of group bonding and the idea of in-group language. Yeah. Right. That yes. Even yeah. our little silly wordplay uh -huh. Uh, from the Oristaya, that was kind of something we kept tightly. It was like a little secret among the three of us. In fact, I think at times we tried yeah, to yeah. share it with other people, and they were like, "That's not that funny." But the three of us would just <laughs> squeal. It really wasn't. No. <laughs> but yeah, you, you know, had to be there. <laughs> you had to be there. But it was it was about group group bonding. Yes, and then and then frankly, yes. jokes that we and by we I mean I would make around the training analysts <laughs> that which I am not going to repeat. Yes, it was <clears throat> it was only you, Joseph. Uh, it was only me. <laughs> but uh but to depotentiate yeah, some of that uh that stress yeah. and all the projections of power mm -hmm. you know onto them. So again, group bonding and mm -hmm. shifting power that vulgarity can both give us a sense of being powerful as well as taking power away from something that is um, yeah. throwing us off our center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm remembering when Deb and we took the propodeutikum exams at the same time, and we had flown out early, and we were there with our good friend, um, Katrin, and we were, we were, so we were get preparing ourselves. We were studying. We were trying to kind of ground ourselves. Um, <laughs> we, we, I remember this particular lunch, <laughs> and I'm I'm not going to report the conversation, but I will say that we were all very scared. We were very tense. We were anxious about the exams. It really felt like a trial that we were entering into, and. Um, <laughs> We just had the most ribald, absurd conversation um, that that I think did exactly what you were talking about, Joseph. It sort of decentered the power. We we were feeling so kind of mm -hmm. at the mercy of this process, yes. and the the particular form that our vulgar conversation took uh, was very much in the direction of uh, you know us kind of seizing the reins of control of the process, I yeah. would say, in a certain uh, uncharacteristic right. way. And, uh, yeah. you know, we still laugh about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I don't know if it was that funny, but it still makes us all laugh, that conversation, which we recall with some yeah. regularity. So. Uh, it is a way of seizing power. 
yeah. of that there we were, you know, headed into uh, four oral exams facing, in each case, three examiners. Mm-hmm. Ah! And so in this uh, ribald, uh, vulgar way, we could take power. Uh, you know, uh, we can make fun. We can do a little bit of one-upsmanship. We can turn the tables. We can shatter the norms. Uh, we can yep. claim our, our autonomy. Um, well, and there's a, young, a youthful, you know, sort of innocent uh, quality to all of this, but it helped. Well, and thinking, I just, just a little more Jungian humor, of course, there was the propodoctorum. <laughs> <laughs> and this yeah. goes to the, the role of the fool. Ex- yeah, just to explain that for just a second, is that oh, Deb yes, wrote this really, Deb wrote this really oh, my hilarious goodness. kind of send up of trying to explain to your relative what the propodoiticum was. And, uh, Yes. Yeah, it was it was um, a little vulgar too. It, was it, had, it, had, it had to do with proctology. And um <laughs> I, I, I you know, but I remember reading that to you guys at the Philadelphia seminar and you started falling off your chairs and I honestly didn't know what was going on. What what was wrong with you? And then I finally got the courage to read it at this little open mic night. Yes. Um, did I dare offer my vulgarity send up, you know, out there in public? And you know what? There was a bit of a backlash to that. Yeah. Was there? Um, yeah. Oh, yes, there was. I didn't and, know that. Uh, yeah. But, but it was a quality that I think vulgarity has in it of daring. Yes. yes. Uh, of daring yes. to transgress yes. And, yes. and daring to be out there. And I think some of the really best comedians have that quality. It's very risky. Mm. Is it going to be funny? Are they going to laugh? Will people be on your side or will they look at you as if, you know, you're just some sort of ridiculous outlaw? Um, so there, there is a, a process of you know, how vulgar can we be and to whom mm-hmm. and when and in what mm-hmm. way? Hello, listeners. I want to take just one minute to remind you about my upcoming women's fairy tale and yoga retreat. We have just a few tickets left. It is April 25th through April 28th in central Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful time of year to be there. It's a great group of women. We have a ton of fun. We hang out. We do yoga. We talk about fairy tales. We eat good food. Uh, we tell stories and share poems around the campfire. Uh, we do some dream incubation. It's a really great time. So if you're interested, pop on over to my website, lisamarciano.com, where you can read more about Women's Wellspring Retreat. Thanks. And it goes to that fine line around humor and um, being offensive and 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 what mm-hmm. is considered offensive is is a very broadly moving dial and and certainly being exposed to something over and over again tends to normalize it and we move it out of the category of unacceptably yeah. offense to something that yes. might be humorous and then from humor something that's ordinary because there are certain things that might have been uh, shockingly hilarious that now really wouldn't make us laugh because we've seen that incongruity so many times Mm -hmm. that there isn't that swift shift of consciousness. So when we think about the propriety laws that were in place in television in the 1950s, that for instance, uh, in I Love Lucy, they showed an image of the bedroom and Lucy and Ricky slept in separate beds on the other side of the room, little single cots because it was considered inappropriate <laughs> to even <laughs> scandalous to show a bed where two people would be sleeping in the same bed or that people mm-hmm. had, if, if adults were sitting on a bed in a film, one foot had to be kept on the ground or else there would be a suggestion that something else might happen. And now we would, that seems silly, not even funny, but 
silly because the cultural norms have shifted. But I think what we're seeing also is the dial shifts back and forth. So we can um, find what would have been considered soft porn Mm -hmm. showing up easily in most of the movies that we see. But common words have now become quote unquote trigger words. And now they're they're yes. obscene. They're unacceptable. They're shocking. They're not funny at all. They're and there's this kind of they're new put sort on of the puritanism. List. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, but that's well, part of this idea of the sacred, profane, vulgar. Yeah, um, oh. the dial moving all around. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the, there are new forbidden words, mm-hmm. and one of my favorite forbidden words. I have a couple of them. Are you really ready? Bathroom. Toilet. We have to call it the restroom, the ladies' room, uh, the necessary room. Uh, but for some reason, we never refer to it as a bathroom or going to the toilet. Uh, a call of nature. People are yeah. very delicate about powder, that. Powder and, 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 room. Oh, the powder, powder. room. I'll oh, just. Uh, in an age where four-letter words abound, uh, we pussyfoot around bathrooms and toilets. Well, I mean, the thing is, a bathroom is actually also a, a euphemism, right? Because you're not going there to take a bath. And I remember being in, <laughs> in France and asking where the bathroom was, and they laughed at me, and they're like, you want the toilet. You know, because they didn't, they don't, they don't use that euphemism, or at least they didn't in that part of France. So, I, you know, I, and, and it, it, so, but, but now even bathroom is a little, is a little risque or something. So, but toilet is much more to the point, isn't it? That's, that's the most straightforward word. Absolutely. And, and also, um, vulgarity can be used as a form of dominance. That when we're angry, mm. or when we're seeking to express power, and so then the shock is about um, presenting oneself in a posturing kind of way. And I think about this scene um, in Mommy Dearest, which is an, an old movie that's mm-hmm. tragic in a lot of ways, but Joan Crawford uh, somehow inherits this seat on the board of directors of Coca-Cola. And they're all old men. They're, they're being totally dismissive of her and telling her how they're going to buy her out and shush her out of the room. You know, and the actress, Faye Dunaway, she stands up playing Joan Crawford. She leans, slaps her hands on the tables and says, don't fuck with me, boys. And um, <laughs> you can see just the, the fierceness yeah. in her face and the men just reeling back and shutting up. Mm-hmm. So um, in that moment, it's about using, using vulgarity or profanity to take a stand and to try to at least signal that I am powerful and that I can break the you know, rules. Yes. What comes up for me around that is um, a, a, a more modern example of, from Succession. Mm-hmm. I don't know if either of you saw it, but it was such a great television show. And Kendall is uh, one of the lead characters who's who's always trying to um, act like he's the big guy, but he's you know sort of suffers from incompetence and insecurity. But especially when he's in some kind of big business deal, he he's always you know fucking this and fucking that, and he's trying to come across as cool. But I think he's also trying to evoke that power. Joseph, that you're referring to, and he, you know, it's such a great acting job because he he's not able to do it really convincingly, the character, and and so there's a lot of nuance in it. But but I think he's trying to do exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So so there is power in the ability to shock, and particularly yes. to shock in a way that feels primitive and unrefined. Like, and, you and don't know what that, I'm capable of. You don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to follow the rules. hmm Yes, exactly. That I'm dangerous. 
because I can break even just a linguistic rule. Yeah. Uh, it accesses a layer of primal energy mm -hmm. of uh, carrying it off with that kind of power in the, the Joan Crawford scene of it's primal. And that's very contagious. Uh, we really get it when somebody is experiencing a level of, of feeling that goes way beyond and way beneath anything that's civilized or rational or anything. And it stops us in our tracks. And it has to be primal and it has to be a little dangerous and it has to be carried off with conviction and power. Yeah. You know, there's another Jungian concept that I'd like to link this to, to. I think we've been talking around it the whole time, but it's the idea of the trickster. Mm. Mm. And the trickster often revert, resorts to vulgarity. There are some wonderful trickster stories that involve, you know, shit and penises and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, in all of what we've been talking about with humor and uh, this idea about transgression or breaking the norms is all associated with trickster. And trickster energy can be in service to, uh, uh, you, you know, things that are less than uh, lofty, but, but ultimately the trickster plays this very deep function of renewal of the culture and is is often in service to growth both in personal life mm. and in collective life so i think that vulgarity is sort of maybe one of trickster's tools mm -hmm. so uh an interesting um example of that is um i don't know if you guys remember when their um that a, a group of Oregon self-organized militia folks took over a federal building. Was that in Oregon? Mm -hmm. This is something yeah, that happened so. uh, a while ago. And uh, there was a standoff. Sadly, one of them was killed um, as they started waving a gun. But people started mailing them bags of dicks. That it was a thing, like bags of little penises that they kept uh, mailing to them. And they were getting boxes <laughs> and boxes of these things <laughs> as a way of kind of insulting them, as a kind of trickster um, expression. And there where was did, one where were they kind getting of, these penises from? Yeah, whose well, penises? <laughs> well, like, apparently there is a cottage industry where you can buy little. Uh, little uh, plastic penises by the hundreds oh plastic, and, uh, plastic. oh they oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking <laughs> i was like what oh my god <laughs> no they weren't literal i was like i thought it was really <laughs> dark okay little plastic penises no I'm, no I'm no i'm there with you now yeah uh, of course calling them all dicks for doing this but that's an example of too. that little dicks um of this trickster um and that the, for whatever reason the post office was still allowed to deliver things even yeah. though there was like a standoff with guns and so there was this uh moment where the leader of the group was um was doing a little bit of a video message to the public and he brings it up and he goes and those of you that keep you know mailing us boxes of dicks don't waste your time the whole thing was so wildly absurd and strange mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. would be something that would be inserted into this life-threatening um, and, and politically dangerous situation. That's trickster. But, and it also brings in an element of how uh, vulgarity can be used as an instrument of contempt. Oh, okay. uh, to yep. uh, to mm -hmm. really demean, yeah. um, and uh, humiliate. Uh, in this case, these uh, these people of 
you know, you're just a bunch of little dicks. Um, it seems like it didn't really succeed, but uh, vulgarity uh, is often used to put people down. Mm-hmm. It's a form of satire. That's yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Something that you had were saying earlier, Deb, is that there is something particularly about um, vulgar language as an emotional outlet that actually changes neurochemistry. And this is something that we probably have all experienced when we've hurt ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, that if you, and I've done ah. this, I, I broke my little toe once. It was really awful. I was walking barefoot. Ooh. I hit the corner oh. of a couch. I heard a sound that sounded like a carrot being broken. And I was like, fuck. Oh, oh God. Shit. <laughs> See, we're doing it right now, right? Ah. We're all there. Yes. I looked out and my, my little toe was like at a 90 degree angle. Oh, no. And that was the first one. I was like, fuck. <laughs> it was so. And, and the interesting thing is that studies have shown yes. that swearing in a moment like that actually increases pain tolerance and is an effort <laughs> at emotional regulation. <laughs> that's that's I did, amazing. It was gruesome. But uh, I have to say that I did pack ice on it immediately, numbed it out, and then this wonderful resident at the ER put it back in place. So it was a clean break. Uh, but that, but it was the uh, the carrot the carrot sound. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, you got me. <laughs> you can stop now. I got the picture. No, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. So, but isn't that a great example of a little bit of vulgarity there? Of, of, and imagine this toe like a carrot breaking. It's like, ooh, dragging us into something kind of awful, but we're sitting here safely, so it's okay. Oh. Um, and this is um, an example of what it's like to sit next to Joseph at a meeting when you really <laughs> want to be serious. So, so now the next time we're together, I'll have a bag of carrots. <laughs> And I'll, I'll bite them in a crunchy way and then stare at you when you least expect it. Yeah. So another um, dimension, I think, of vulgarity, profanity, obscenity um, has to do with psychological ambivalence. People have Hmm. very ambivalent feelings towards vulgarity, for instance, that they are Mm -hmm. simultaneously attracted to the emotional expressiveness and humor, and at the same time, they can be repelled by its potential to offend or to violate social Mm -hmm. norms. Mm. And that we, we have both of those feelings in us. And that's why, you know, we can go. To, again, I love David, Dave Chappelle. So you're listening to Dave Chappelle and he's, his timing, the way he's introducing something mm-hmm. is so outrageous. Everyone's laughing. But then the three of us could sit here and look at the same topic and suddenly it's not funny at all. Uh, yeah. And that we have, we're able to hold both of those tensions inside of us, um, which I think is, is important. Um, and challenging, which is why I think humor, as you were saying earlier, can be a kind yeah. of dangerous game because the dial is moving all the time. But there is something, and I think that's a great point that it's about ambivalence, and there's a way that we might find ourselves laughing at something and not even wanting to find it funny. You know, we're sort of being like mm-hmm. dragged across the line and being shown yeah. for the little, you know, potty, potty mouthed person that we are or whatever, when someone, you know, cracks a fart joke and we're, we're, we're trying to act sophisticated, but we can't help it. We just crack up. Um, but so I, I, I like, I like ambivalence, but I, I think there's something important here about, um, I, I, I just am really distrustful of anyone who can't uh, find something humorous. There's some, there's something psychological going on when we always revert to offense and we can't, we can't 
role, have a good role in the mud. You know, mm-hmm. there's some, there's something that the, the psyche is too rigid. And that again, that goes to the role of the trickster. The role of the trickster is to, uh, to, to, to break apart something that's gotten overly yeah. rigid. And I, I think vulgarity of the topic that we've been talking about today is absolutely a part of that. That, you know, that, that our ego or persona perhaps has gotten too crusty and vulgarity invites us to kind of get, get down in the mud a little bit, you know, and that, that there's something really healthy about that. I think that that has something to do with the inability to transcend shame and anger. Because taking offense, when someone is, someone is chronically claiming being offended, there is both a sense of shame that's being moved from the individual mm-hmm. onto the other person and shames them for doing it. And it's also an opportunity yep. to express anger and aggression. So if one is, is an invested outreach. with anger, aggression, mm-hmm. and shame, then that is not an environment where humor or laughter can easily exist. They don't, mm-hmm. they don't generally go together because humor would pop you right out of shame and rage because you're kind of giggling all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So some people can get, as you were saying, really trapped yeah. in that kind of yeah. pain and misery. Yeah. So in a way, the ultimate um, attribute of vulgarity is its ability to help us transcend uh, the usual norms. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, whether it's something like shame or anger or um, propriety or a hundred other things, that it's a very lowness and appeal to bodily functions and, and, and other kind of body uh, fundamentals of human existence. This, that is also transcendence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that seems like a great place to stop for now and perhaps switch to a dream. Okay. On that note, I'm going to Uh, use an old-fashioned form of profanity, a term that I've come to love. God's teeth. Let's move to a dream. (laughs) (laughs) That that was, gosh, that was shocking. Um, Shocking. (laughs) Today's dreamer is a woman. She's 36 years old. She's a healthcare administrator, and she has entitled her dream, I Should Call. And here's the dream. I had a dream that I was with my friend at a large park, and then I went to the bathroom. While I was in the stall, a lady with white hair laid down on the ground and was peering into the stall where I was. She was being completely creepy and strange. I was yelling at her to stop, but she wouldn't listen. I remembered feeling she was unwell and possessed. I realized I should have videotaped her actions and called the cops, but I didn't. I left the bathroom, and when I did, I realized that my friend had left me. I thought to myself, I'm going to call him, but I didn't. I then walked over to a large field that was going downhill. I kept walking on it, almost tripping down, but realized I was walking on tons of planted seeds. I felt horrified knowing I was stepping on these seeds, but the strangers around me didn't seem to care that we were trampling these seeds. They were all at the bottom near a fence, watching a scene unfold. You could hear a little girl crying. She kept saying, no, and stop. She was helpless against her oppressor, and I wondered who was hurting her this way. As I get closer, I can see that it was her mother beating her up. Another lady was videotaping it. The little girl was dejected and sad and hurt. The mother seemed possessed and out of her mind. I said, 
We need to call 911. Has anyone called? The crowd said, no, nobody has called. Right as I'm about to call, I see another woman teacher has called over the mother to talk to her and tell her this abuse must stop. The little girl stops crying and the lady is saying she will stop being so harsh with her daughter. I am thinking, this is ridiculous. Call the cops, put this lady in jail, she will never stop. I should call, but I never did. For context, your dreamer says, I feel like I am pouring into many people without very much appreciation. I'm a single mother without support. I work a demanding job. I feel I am getting older and have lost my maiden energy. I'm surprised by life being not what I thought. I thought goodwill toward others meant something. But as I get older, I feel like much of it becomes an obligation to love and take care of those around you because it's the right thing to do, not necessarily because you always feel like it. The main feelings in the dream, she says, are longing for resolution and for people to do what's right, feeling shocked by people's actions, the friend leaving the woman in the bathroom stall, the people just watching a woman abuse her daughter, the abusive mother, the teacher giving the mother a chance to redeem herself. And she finally adds, I have been trying to support a friend who was recently diagnosed with Huntington's disease. The friend who left me in my dream. His actions have been very hurtful toward me as I notice him changing. My mother also recently had a cancer diagnosis and I have been trying to be supportive of her. She was an alcoholic while I was growing up, though we are close now. Somehow there is a link between these two people and my historical desire to help and save people without care or appreciation back toward me. The abusive mother ended up being my old high school teacher. This is a longer, more complex dream. And sometimes what can be helpful with a dream like this is almost to kind of chunk it into scenes. So... Mm -hmm. First, there's this scene of her in the bathroom stall. Then there's the scene of kind of tripping down the hill and trampling on the seeds. And then at the bottom of the hill, there's this scene with this mother abusing uh, the daughter and, and the response to it. So it's, it's kind of interesting just to notice that. And of course, when we do it that way, we can see that there's a kind of parallel thing that happens in the first scene and the third scene. In the first scene, there's this kind of crazy old woman who transgresses yeah. and she's sliding under the bathroom stall and it's, you know, it's this, it, she seems possessed. And then mm -hmm. in, the, in the third scene, there's the mother who's abusing the daughter. And again, the mother seems possessed. So that there, there's an echo of, of that those two things are, are somehow parallel. And so that, that helps us understand that when the little girl is being abused, of course, that's an image of a way that the, the, the ego is being, the dream ego is being abused. Because in the first scene, it's the dream ego who is impinged upon by the possessed woman. Mm -hmm. So I wonder about the, and I know I'm going right here for the big guns, but I, I wonder about mm -hmm. the quality of mother. Mm -hmm. You know, she says she's close with her mother now, but it's very difficult to grow up with an alcoholic mother. And I wonder about her own feelings about mothering and, and what that's like for her, partly because of what she said in the context, but, but also because there's, um, there's, there's something kind of not right here about the, the mothering that were, that were shown in the dream, obviously. Um, the, 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 there is an, a, a, a the, the, the impulse of the school teacher to say, let, let me give you another chance to extend toward the abusive mother um, some kindness or, or some understanding. And yet the dream ego uh, is very impatient with that. But I am wondering 
if that isn't actually what's needed, that there needs to be some generosity extended toward the kind of possessed women in this dreamer's psyche. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know what I'm paying attention to in the three scenes that you uh, elucidated, Lisa, is um, there is no happy resolution at all in this dream. Yeah. Of, of in any of these scenes, of the the first scene of being impinged on by a possessed woman lying down and looking into the bathroom stall. Then the second scene of everybody's trampling on the seats. The you know the hopeful new beginning that something can grow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the seeds of growth are being stomped on. And then in the third scene, uh, the, the abused little girl, and uh, the dream ego is not supportive of uh, the woman who says, you have to stop doing this. And the lady says, okay, I'll stop. But our dream ego says, no. You know, she goes for a punitive stance of, you should just call the cops and put yeah. her in jail. Uh, um, so I'm just paying attention to the feeling tone that the dream ego repeatedly experiences of something awful, something possessed, something abusive, something uh, trampling and hurting. A- and um, the the. This is a this is a really significant dream of of pairing it with with her comments of of I'm a single mother without support and pouring into people without appreciation. Mm-hmm. I think this dream is out picturing this situation, these feelings in the dreamer's life. You look really pensive, Joseph. Well, I think there's um, so many little pieces that I'm just curious about. Any one of them are mm-hmm. to capture my attention. This um, phrase that she says, um, call, but I didn't. She's going to, in the beginning, there's call the cops, but I didn't. Call the friend, but I didn't. Someone should call, they didn't. But I should call, but I never did. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. There, there's something about the, um, the ego's, rep- the mm. repetition of the ego being offered a dramatization of some kind of a, of a crisis that requires her ability, the ego's ability to, to call out, to connect ask for help Mm -hmm. or ask for clarification or ask for information or intervention. But it seems that that's the activity I should call, Mm -hmm. but I didn't. So she's curious about that, secondary to the various Mm -hmm. contexts that might, it might have been helpful for her to make a call. Why? Why is she so hesitant to make calls? And what is a mm-hmm. call? So it's, it's an action that she would have to initiate. It would mm-hmm. require her to, to ask something, to reveal something. And what I would imagine, it would set something in motion that she would then have to be responsible for. Call the friend and say, where'd you go? And risk perhaps mm-hmm. conflict or call the cops the first time and then perhaps the second time, which then she would somehow be involved with mm-hmm. a, a repercussion, a, a regulating experience. But she is, for some reason, she's ambivalent at the very least. Mm-hmm. So I would, that's the place that I would lean into secondary to the dramatization of the events. Mm -hmm. So I have a thought about that, which is, uh, you know, because then she calls it, I, you know, she titles the dream I should have called or something. 
So mm-hmm. yes. you're absolutely right. right. This is a real, this is the overarching theme. And I am making this up, okay? But here's an imagination I have. I was really struck by her saying, my mom was an alcoholic when I was growing up, but we're close now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from what I know about working with people who've had an alcoholic parent is that that is not, that's not something that, that just simply kind of melts away into the ether. But depending on the severity of it and the circumstances around it, I find that it shapes people's psychological experience in a pretty profound way, even when the parent, you know, hopefully gets clean and uh, repairs the relationship, which is wonderful. And I celebrate both of these people for managing to do that. So I don't want to take anything away from that. But I wonder if there's a kind of sweeping aside of the effects of what it was like to grow up with an alcoholic parent. By the way, one of the things is beca- is that you often become a kind of inveterate caregiver who has trouble attending to your own needs because you, as a child, were so oriented to your your parent and always trying to see, oh, which mom am I getting today? You know, some people with alcoholic parents literally wind up caring for them. You know, let me make sure that she's got her alcohol because I don't want her to go into DTs or. I know she hasn't eaten or she's smoking again and I don't want her to fall asleep and set the house on fire. I mean, these are all stories I've heard. Yeah. So, you know, th- this, this woman, one of her issues is she's giving and giving and giving and giving and, and realizing that it's really burning her out. Well, that could mm-hmm. be a sequelae of having grown up with an alcoholic parent, that that's one of the ways it influenced you. So Joseph, yeah. I wonder if I could have called the cops refers to a kind of inner possibility of calling of kind of acknowledging the harm done in that situation and if perhaps it doesn't she doesn't feel able to because you know maybe the mother has you know really made amends and she doesn't want to indulge in kind of going back in parent blaming which i yeah. respect actually i think we can oftentimes go into mm-hmm. that too much. And that can be a downside actually of a therapeutic process is it kind of cultivates that attitude of let me go dig up all the harms done. Um, but I do wonder in this case, or my fantasy goes to, you know, do we need to call the cops here and just say, yeah, here's what happened actually. And, and it, although it's not happening anymore with mom, which again is great, the internalized dynamics are still happening. So she's still Mm. feeling impinged upon to care for other people. Yeah. And by the way, being possessed can also sort of be like being drunk or rather another way to say it is maybe people who are drunk can often seem possessed. Yeah. What I want to lean into in addition to that is, um, and I feel so much certain about this, or strongly about it, certain it's too much. I think it's also a dream about dissociation. That the, the center of the dream were given a really important moment, which is easy to overlook because it seems quite less dramatic, but I walk over into a large field. I'm almost tripping. Suddenly I realize I've been walking on tons of planted seeds, just trampling them. No one seems to care that we're trampling the seeds. Now, all of us that have had um, traumatic childhood experiences, one of the ways we survive, and it is a kind of grace at the time, is that we dissociate. Um, we can fully dissociate so that we don't experience anything and perhaps barely remember things. We can dissociate from our feelings so that we remain calm. We can dissociate from our physical sensations so that we're protected from overwhelming hurt and pain. And at some point, if the analysis goes deep enough, we begin to call back to ourselves these things that we have lost. When we are dissociated, we can have an idea. Someone should make a call. 
someone should leave the room. Mm -hmm. Somebody should stop this. But it's kind of happening in a kind of a secret phone booth Mm -hmm. inside of our head. And our body and hands are not moving to do those things because in the traumatic moment, there is a disconnect between our perhaps even clear thinking and our ability to actually mobilize or feel the full depth of emotion, as you were saying, Lisa, or to feel the physical discomfort or pain. So there is a mm-hmm. kind of secret room inside of us when we've been traumatized, and we don't realize that all this stuff is happening in a little cordoned off box inside of ourselves that isn't reaching other parts of the psyche and even other parts of the body. And I wonder if that might be part of what the dream Mm -hmm. is pointing to. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm really pondering this dream and and, uh, entering into the mood of it and resonating uh, to what you brought up, Joseph, of all the times in this dream of, of calling and people don't listen, should have videotaped but didn't, the cops um, calling and calling, and the very last sentence is, I should call, but I never did. And I'm, I'm wondering about her capacity here to use her voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only to tell other people this is what I feel and think and want and need, but to call herself back. Uh, to, To the the strong injunction in the dream against taking action, against a confrontation that she can't call, she doesn't videotape, nobody has called. Um, And what it would mean for her metaphorically to to call, to start calling, uh, lifting things up into daily life, into interactional life, and into the internet action between herself and herself. And I think that the image of the teacher is the medicine in the dream. Mm. Because finally, there's a feminine figure that um, comes forward, is able Mm. to look at the mother and say, stop. And she actually stops. You see, in the beginning... She's looking at the woman who's peering under the stall, stall, and she's shouting, stop, stop, stop. But nothing, no one hears her. Mm-hmm. But yeah. the teacher mm-hmm. inside of her, by the way, this is a part of her mm-hmm. psyche, is the part of her that can go over into a tumultuous situation inside of herself, perhaps outside of herself as well, and actually carry kind of authority so that the disorder or the chaos in the psyche and around her actually responds. And that kind of is one of the superpowers of a really good teacher, I think, of the grade school teachers that I experienced and their ability to wield authority to create order in the classroom or Mm -hmm. monitor and, and create repercussions for kids that couldn't regulate themselves. So that I think a a teacher is probably a good paradigm for taking control of the chaos and sitting mm-hmm. down and talking and communicating with even these um, errant parts of herself, her own possessed parts. Even the woman who's staring at her under the stall seems to be in a trance. She also mm-hmm. seems dissociated. Mm-hmm. The friend who wanders off, that's a form of dissociation. I didn't know where you were. I just, I don't know. I just wandered off, and then I was somewhere else in the, in the park. I, I have no idea. The mother's kind of in, 
possessed in some dissociated screaming state. Mm -hmm. But the teacher's holding the reality principle. Stop. Come over here. We're going to have a talk. Yep. <laughs> yep. So there's hope yeah. in the dream. Mm -hmm. and, and the yes, teacher is perhaps a progressed form of herself as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.